So my name is Rob Ashton and I trade as the Barefoot Entrepreneur. And I guess I, I like exploring difficult enterprise conundrums. I like to do things that people think can't be done. And then I write about it, occasionally speak about it. And um, when I've recovered from the trauma, I then do it all again. <laughs> I think what drives me is a strong sense of equality of opportunity. So I'm the bright kid who failed as 11 plus, went to a, a crap secondary modern school, didn't do well in the educa education system, and years later joined Mensa and found that my problem wasn't that I was stupid, that, that I was bright. And so I go through life seeing where people are excluded from opportunity just because they're different from the norm. And I just think that people who are conventional and normal they just, yes, they run in the middle, but they never get to change the world. The world changing stuff comes from the people who are different. So they're the ones I'll try and support. So traditionally, um, people would be like Bill Gates and you make stacks of money from trading and ripping people off. And then you would uh, become philanthropic as you became older and more aware of your mortality. And you would give millions away to help starving Africans. Today, I think people do that as they go along. And the business that has an overt social purpose, so purpose alongside profit, um, tends to differentiate itself and do better than the one that just sets out to make money. So I think that tomorrow's business will be almost a blend of the social enterprise, which is about doing good or charity, and, and the for-profit business. We'll see a whole, a whole generation of hybrids, I think, sort of cross-sector and organisations doing, doing good things. I think um, social media has been very empowering. People can speak out about things they see as being unjust and wrong and get traction and get noticed. So you cannot afford now to be bad to your customers because everybody will find out. So being good to your customers and encouraging them to tell everybody about it actually works in your favour and their favour and for the good of everybody. So, so many people will say to me, I want to start a business, I don't know what to do. And effectively, what you need to do is to look back at yourself. Look, look at, back at your life and what you do and your experiences and where you've been and what you've done. And what are the things that really make you angry? The things that haven't been done, that you just think should have been done. And nine times out of ten, you will have an interest in the drive to do it because you'll, you'll, you'll be annoyed about it. But also probably you'll have an understanding of what you have to do and some of the skills need to make it happen. Well, my biggest fear is where somebody who's been the whole life doing A decides that all of a sudden they're going to open a restaurant <laughs> because they like eating out and then they find out that running a restaurant is a very different business to eating a restaurant. So do something that you know something about, that you understand something about and ideally something that makes you angry. Because when you get angry, that's what keeps you going when they're doing it's tough. For example, Swarm Apprenticeships uh, started five years ago and the reason I started it was because I was, the, I was the bright kid that did badly at school. And I was invited back to my former secondary modern school to do the presentation evening and hands out the certificates to all these kids and I spotted that there were spelling mistakes on the certificates, the punctuation in the wrong place, the teacher didn't really seem to really care, the head teacher had his head full of um, creating nuclear scientists for the power station just down the road, not thinking about practical skills for the, for the people. And the young people I spoke to all felt they were in the wrong place, the wrong town. And so I thought, well, how do we change that? How do we get so people feel they're in the right place and doing the right thing? And so Swarm Apprenticeships was about supporting bright kids who fall out of the education system to measure their impact on an employer's business by using an apprenticeship that teaches about business about enterprise. So they measure their impact. They can see that they're making more money for their boss than they're costing. That builds their confidence and it also keeps them in a job. <laughs> if you haven't got a job, then you have less to lose than if you have got a job and you give it up. So that's one good reason for starting a social enterprise now. The other reason would be that having a purpose beyond just making money is, is kind of quite good. And I think increasingly it's possible to make money by doing good stuff as well as just by making money. So I've been working for a while now, low key, on a project with a large provider of daycare to adults with learning disability who tend to get parked in daycare 
with a personal budget and kind of amused, entertained, but not developed, stretched or taught anything. Around creating a cooperative that could provide employment for them, where they could own that cooperative, it could do things for companies. The companies would not face the perceived risk of employing someone with a learning disability. And um, I confronted the local authority about how they might fund us to do that and set that up with the money they will save in the long term from not having to pay them personal budgets because they're earning money. Um. So I think qualifications can be important to be a social entrepreneur, but I don't think the qualifications that you're thinking about are the ones that you might need. I don't think you need the ones that you get at school or college or even university. You need the, you need the qualification that just comes with that resiliency builder over years of being saying, of not accepting that something can't be done constantly challenging and asking questions and then recognising that the answer is usually there but just hidden where people can't see it. I think one of the skills that I have is that I can I can almost tell a story, I can I can I can create something as a, as a, as a, as a almost an illusion that this is what it could be like um, and, and then and then solve people that idea. So people don't seem to be able to see what isn't there. They can only see what's right under the nose. So there is a stereotype that the, the, the entrepreneur can, can do no wrong, that everything's perfect, that they have a magic wand and everything they touch turns into pots of gold and I think that's complete rubbish. I think that the really honest entrepreneur will tell you that they don't know what they're doing, that they feel their way, that they fall in all the pitfalls, that they get a bloody nose, that they run out of money, that all the things that can go wrong do go wrong. And what sets you apart as a successful entrepreneur from a failure is that you just keep going. You just have to keep bouncing back and keep going on and on and on. And eventually you get through. What's interesting is the boring people that, that, that have steady jobs and don't do anything more exciting than watching TV in the evening. They, um, they just don't understand that they, they, they go home at five o'clock and forget about stuff and, and you don't. As an entrepreneur, you're thinking about work all the time. You'll get up in the night, make notes next on a piece of paper next to the bed. It just never goes away. So it's just about tenacity, determination, and um, refusing to give up. I find team working quite challenging, so I'm very much a, a loner. I've had times in my career I've employed up to 10 people, and I hated every minute of that. <laughs> uh, I'm no good at managing people. I have no tolerance of people's domestic challenges or their cat sale or their car broke down on the way to work. I just expect people to be here to be doing what they're doing and, and that's it. Um, so I tend to work alone and what I find I do best is by acting like a catalyst. So I'll provoke teams of people into seeing things differently and, and then work with the either the fallout or the success that that generates rather than leading a team. Um, I think you do need a team and there's an argument that says that you, you, you need the pioneer but the pioneer, pioneer also needs to have somebody who knows how to do stuff to fall on behind. So with Swarm Apprenticeships, I had the vision, I challenged the county council, I got the original client to get started, I made the first moves but I quite quickly brought somebody into the business who wouldn't have started it on his own but who very much can make it happen and follow through. And um, I tend to promise things and he then goes around and um, tells people what we can really do. <laughs> yeah, so I think help is interesting. You all, everybody needs help because they don't know what they don't know. And the challenge is to find somebody who will tell you what you don't know rather than what they think you need to know, which may be <laughs> totally irrelevant. So I worry about the professional expert who's there to help you. I worry about the uh, publicly funded uh, support agencies who offer advice because often they have an agenda that might be different to your own. I think the best way to learn is by doing and trial and error and you just make sure that you don't take such big risks that you, you can't play again if you lose one round. And also I think there's a lot to be said for adopting mentors. So I um, tend to find people that are doing what I'd like to be doing in a few years time and I hang on their coattails and learn from them, say nice things to them, uh, drink tea with them sometimes and just listen to what they have to say and you just pick up things like that. I think there's also the danger that people join these various business networking groups which are full of people like them that try to sell things 
And I like drawing things that are cross-cutting, that get people from different backgrounds and different disciplines, looking at different things in different ways. So it's about, you learn from other people, but not necessarily from people who think they're teaching or anything. I think all these things that have a, have a, have a matrix where you populate it with words are useful. But the, again, the interesting things you need to look at are things that aren't prompted by the questions those sort of analyses ask you to do. And the big danger is that you assume that because you've got a pestle analysis, like competitor analysis, this analysis, that analysis, a few of the hands off matrices, you've got everything covered and actually you probably haven't because you've missed the very thing you need to think about, which is the customer. I mean, I think that the, you can plan, but you can over plan. I think you can, the best planning is done with the customer what do they want? Why will they buy your product? So I was with, I was with somebody this morning, it's a, it's a, a national charity, and they've developed um, what they think would be a great idea for a, an online app that they can sell that will generate lots of income and save them the, from having to raise money from sponsors and grants in the future. But they only spoke to one potential customer. Then they threw a bid at a large grant maker who said no. Then they spoke to me about social investment, which is an interesting subject that I have some experience of. And the first investor I spoke to said, so where's the evidence of need? Well, they spoke to one potential customer and they want £150,000. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So now I've restructured their ask. They're asking for some money now to do the research and that will lead to developing the product and that will lead to test marketing and that will lead to them becoming free of raising money through sponsorship and grants. But it wouldn't happen without doing that research first. And the research comes from the customers. So crowdfunding is really good because it puts you on the spot. It, for, it forces you to summarize what it is you're trying to do in about a minute of video, and that's important. It forces you to have um, a logical business plan, so what you want to do and what's in it for people that support you. Um, and it also forces you to, well, it just forces you to confront the reality of what you're trying to do. Having done that, you then put the thing out there on, on say, Crowdfunder UK, which is the platform I tend to use, and people will love it or hate it based on what you said. So it's real instant feedback from your marketplace. So with Norwich Mustard, which I started earlier this year, uh, we raised £7,800 on Crowdfunder from 184 people. Now, if one person had put all the money on, that wouldn't have been half as important as having nearly 800 people, sorry, nearly 200 people, £8,000. So I had just recorded a, probably a couple of minute video sitting on my tractor. So wouldn't it be interesting to have Norwich Mustard? Wouldn't it be interesting to turn that anger at Coleman's closure in Norwich to say more positive than people just campaigning and waving placards and shouting at Unilever? And it, it just turned around. And then you said, so now I've got 200 people that support it. Um, that got me a match funding grant from Power to Change. So you find that the people, the grant makers will match what you raise from your crowd far more readily than they will just give you a grant. Because why would they give you a grant? with the support of people, you've, you've demonstrated there's need. So what you, I think people who support you in a crowdfunding campaign will get something from it, yeah? There has to be, and the skill is an incentive that you offer. So if you take um, share issues, which are often quite done on, um, on crowdfunding platforms, you'll have a level of incentives from sort of 100 quid you get something that makes you feel good, up to a thousand pounds, you get really nice experiences, you know, sort of, I don't know, dinner with other people that are given a thousand pounds, stuff like that. Um, there's an interesting online publisher called Unbound who crowdfund a book. So you're the author of a book, you have an idea for the book, you put it on uh, their Unbound platform, and then if people will support it, they pre-order a copy. So they pay the 20 quid to get a copy, or they might pay 40 quid to get a signed copy, that they might get 100 quid to get a signed copy and meet you at a, a launch event in London, all of those kind of things. And they build up the, they build up the, you know, the crowd for, for the book. But what that means is then when the book goes to print and when you finish writing it, you know it's got a market. 
it's democratic. Yeah. And you can't you can't question it. So um, I've been talking I've been talking to Unilever, for example, about taking over some of the old equipment they have in their Commons factory to display in what would be the Norwich Mustard Heritage Centre that will open next year. We'll support that with a crowdfunding campaign. Now I know that we'll get thousands of people will ship into that and we'll reward them with mustard. Yeah. Um, and the first people, the first 200 people who contributed to the, the first campaign, you, know, you, you meet them and they're, they're, they're really interested. Yeah. The people that live in houses that used to be part of the Coleman estate, yeah. people that used to work for Coleman's. And you're giving them something they can't otherwise get, you're giving them an emotional connection with something that they can say, well, I own that, I own part of that, it's partly me. So low cost of entry, you just got to record some video, put, put your pitch together. There's lots of data out there that shows you how to pitch the different levels, levels of investment so that you know that if you start at 50 pounds, you'll make less and if you start at 100 pounds, um, you'll get a few big hitters put lots of money in. There's tax incentives for people to invest in a social enterprise or a charity. So it's really interesting. And, and then you find that the, the opponents, the people that will say, no, you shouldn't do that, you should be doing what everybody else is doing, will say, well, you have an answer for them. What, a thousand people want me to do this? Yeah. I can tell you the names. I think it has to be compelling, it has to be emotive, and it has to be current. So with Norwich Mustard, the story of Coleman's closure was still big in the press, it's still big in the press today. Um, everybody had heard of the story, they had heard of, the, they'd heard of Coleman's, they'd heard of the closure of the factory, and they liked the idea of doing something different. So that was a huge, huge benefit. Because it has to be from the heart. You have to really want to do it, you have to really believe in it. Mm. It's not just something you're doing because you're shooting some video for a, for a crowdfunding campaign. Mm. You've got to really want it to happen, and it has to show. I think when you start out, your brand values will be your personal values. So your business is, is a reflection of yourself and your personality. So if you're a nice kind of caring person who's interested in, I don't know, small furry animals, then your organisation will probably have an interest in small furry animals as well and be quite friendly. Um, so, and then as the business matures, as it grows, it has to be, take on, on an identity of its own. I think, um, I think when you have a paid job somewhere, then you, 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 you dress for work, you go to work, you step into that job role and you behave as that person during the day and you go home at night and become you again. I think when you have your own business, whatever the kind of business it is, be it social or otherwise, it's all about you. So your business has to just reflect your personality. And then in time it becomes free of that as it grows. I think social media is really important, but you have to be realistic. So it can be very tempting to spend your entire day on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and good and what else. So I think it's about being, um, speaking out when you have something to say. It's about engaging other people and commenting what other people, that, commenting what other people say. So you can't just program all of your week's tweets and, and let them go off on their own because that just doesn't work. That's kind of soapboxing and it's about interaction and engagement and, and being real, I think. So I find Twitter captivating. I kind of like the art form of trying to summarize a point in a, a relatively small number of characters. Um, I was quite disappointed when it went from 140 to 280 because I thought that was a bit of a cop out the chance to ramble and that you don't need to do that so twitter for me is interesting i wouldn't say that it wins me a lot of work but it it, it gets people aware of what i'm doing um, linkedin is more direct and i tend to write opinion pieces and post on on linkedin usually once a week sometimes less often sometimes more often if something's really on my mind i just knock out 200 words on linkedin illustrate it bang off it goes and it's all about keeping people aware. It's having a large number of people vaguely aware of what you do and what you stand for and what you're trying to achieve, rather than selling, which is you have a small number of people who really know what you're trying to do because you're trying to get them to buy it. There's an academic called, I think, Granovetta, 
and he talks about the relative strength of the weak ties and strong ties. And everybody speaks to and talks to people they know well. And what you need to do is speak to people that you don't know that well, because the people that know you well will, will introduce you and recommend you and pass you around. So spend, spend the time on the, the weak ties, not the strong ties. I think YouTube is interesting because there's so much on YouTube and it's so easy to put stuff on YouTube that how do you find what you want to find on YouTube? It's all about how you search. And I just wonder whether people do sit down one day and think, I'm going to look at how to do crowdfunding today, so I'll search on YouTube tips on crowdfunding. I think you tend to look for the subject and then you find, you bump in something about the subject and then you might find a YouTube clip and then you might look at it. Um, I think most YouTube footage is too long. I think anything over 30 seconds and I lose interest of a minute and I'm starting to get distracted and 90 seconds and I've, I've lost interest altogether and gone away. So while somebody's still sort of getting into the flow of it, they've lost the opportunity. I guess the way to overcome the fear of social media is like overcoming the fear of water. You have to dive in and perhaps dive in just almost at your depth, if not slightly out of your depth, and struggle a bit and, and then find your way to do it. And if you're unsure about social media, then a good thing to do is perhaps to uh, create a profile on something like Twitter and say to people, is this okay? Ask the questions on social media, engage the people you want to engage with and see what comes back. And don't be disheartened by people that um, have massive followings because what you want to the right people to follow you, not everybody to follow you. So there are people that try and sell a service of we can get you more Twitter followers, more LinkedIn followers, more Instagram followers. There's a piece of software that can be used to follow other people on Instagram and then when they follow you, it unfollows them. <laughs> so that you end up acquiring lots of followers, but who wants lots of followers? You just want to have people that are actually interested in what you do, interested in what you stand for, and interested in new business with you.